During the war, there were around 44,000 Holocaust sites, ranging from ghettos and concentration camps to labor camps, internment camps, and killing sites. Nobody has counted how many survive today. Some only survive as a trace in the archaeological record, whereas others are heritage sites or memorials. All of them are crime scenes and evidence of genocide. My research draws attention to the fact that these sites, 80 years since World War II, are at risk from threats such as neglect, decay, vandalism, looting, lack of financial support, inappropriate reuse and climate change. In a world of denial and distortion, and as living witnesses pass away, our focus turns to the physical places as witnesses to the past. And these are in a perilous condition. Even Auschwitz, the one site that everybody has heard of, faces threats. To take the example of the former ghetto of Terezin in the Czech Republic, through which more than 140,000 Jews passed before being transported to extermination camps further east, we know that the ghetto became massively overcrowded, with people squeezed into attics and cellars, leading to the death of 35,000 prisoners from the terrible conditions. The Dresden barracks were an iconic part of the ghetto, known from a propaganda film made by the Nazis. It has been seriously damaged by a series of storms and floods caused by climate change. Inside, glass windows have shattered and the building has become unstable. Restoration will cost hundreds of thousands of euros. Can we justify spending this much at a time when the living need money too? The building then needs to be occupied to avoid succumbing to damp and decay. But what counts as appropriate and ethical reuse of such a place? Can you use it for anything at all, as long as you add a memorial plaque? There are no easy answers. Such dilemmas can be found as we search for responses to every threat facing Holocaust sites today. In terms of how we created the final product, it wasn't really just the case in the end of me saying, Nader, here's my research, you go away and work your magic, because I guess it's not really like that. There was a, a, a lot of need to explain, especially when it comes to the subject matter of the Holocaust, um, where the taboos are, where the sensitivities are, um, what you can display, what you can't display, uh, where you can sort of run with your imagination and where you shouldn't, because when you're working with the Holocaust, there are, um, you know, there are dangers in Holocaust distortion. And so one doesn't want to sort of add elements of imagination to very sensitive parts of the research. So uh, very much it was a process of, of dialogue and I learned from Nada and I'm sure she's learned from me. The collaboration process was very interesting and challenging at the same time. Uh, to combine research, um, evidence-based um, um, information and animation, a medium that has the capacity to expand to fantasy um, and to use this medium, um, working on a sensitive subject with right ethics, uh, considering the taboos um, surrounding um, specifically the project that we were working on, was the aspect that I feel very fortunate that um, I had to face, basically. I think the creative work communicates my research by firing off the imagination. Um, you know, there, there's there's a difference, I suppose, between animated film and just photographs that one takes on on field work. And the animations, I think, can um, really help people understand the subject matter in a more imaginative way than a sort of straight factual series of slides can do. I did think that um, science and research um, are um, great tools for uh, social justice and I still um, do think that. Um, and being an, a trained animator, um, 
we work with um, exaggeration and amplifying emotions um, and then working uh, with um, evidence-based um, um, uh, projects um, I personally learned how to stay more neutral um, to the facts and stay truth to uh, what is there um, and through that make the message um, stronger. I think in the future I will perhaps try and expand my mind a little more to think about my research in a more uh, visual creative way. I think I've always been very locked into sort of seeing my research as a series of ordered logical PowerPoint slides in the way that I would present them at a conference or in a lecture. And I think working in this project has encouraged me to think more creatively about other ways of communicating my work.